Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the ICAA program, Locatecture, with Vitold Rybczynski. I'm the chapter coordinator of the ICAA, Barbara Hogg, and I'm pleased to introduce our program tonight. First, I would like to say thank you to our sponsors who make these fascinating programs possible. Tonight's presentation is presented to you by Pinemar, an award-winning residential construction firm working in Philadelphia, the main line in Chester County. Our dual level sponsors, in addition to Pine Mar, are Capiletti Builders, North American Window and Door, Peter Zimmerman Architects, Tradewood Windows and Doors, Archer and Buchanan Architecture, Duration Molding and Millwork, Ernst Brothers Builders, John Milner Architects, Lepage Millwork, Rittenhouse Builders, Inspire Builders. Vitold Ripchinski was born in Edinburgh and raised in London. He studied architecture at McGill University in Montreal, where he also taught. He is currently an emeritus professor of urbanism at the University of Pennsylvania. His architecture experience has, has included designing houses as a registered architect and researching low cost housing for which he received a 1991 Progressive Architecture Award. He has written 18 books on subjects as varied as the evolution of comfort, a history of the weekend, American urbanism, and the search for the screwdriver's origins. In 2014, he received a Smithsonian's Cooper Hewitt National Design Award for Design Mind. His latest book, Charleston Fancy, Little Houses and Big Dreams in the Holy City, received the 2020 Literary Award from the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. We'll be happy to take a few questions at the end, so please submit any of your questions in the chat box and I'll read them out at the end to Vitold who will talk to us tonight about locatecture. So take it away. Thank you, Barbara. This talk is about a, partly about a, a few chapters from a book that I, I recently completed. And I wanted to talk about the subtitle because that's a good way to introduce this, this talk. It's, it deals with three, the three main themes of the book. Little Houses is about the architecture. Big Dreams is about real estate development because almost all the projects that I talk about in the book are houses and groups of houses and even neighborhoods uh, that are part of real estate developments. Uh, finally, the Holy City the Holy City is the nickname of Charleston, South Carolina, which is where the book is set and where all the uh, projects in the book take place. They're all in and around Charleston. Charleston is a colonial city. It was the fourth largest city in the American colonies. It's at the mouth of two rivers, the Ashley and the Cooper. Uh, forms a harbor which was the source of the town's economic prosperity and growth. Uh, the little black boxes are various projects that I describe in the book, and I'm only really talking about the last part of the book today. Uh, and the project that I am talking about, Cat Fiddle Street, uh, is just at the beginning of the dense part of Charleston. Charleston grew from the bottom of the peninsula up and it was a little bit like Manhattan because it couldn't go sideways. It was, an, it was a narrow peninsula, almost like Manhattan Island. Uh, and it started at the very tip and then worked its way up north and eventually became suburbanized in the, after the First and Second World Wars, and you have then North Charleston and the, the Metropolitan Charleston uh, as, as the city got bigger. So I'm talking about this one project which started in 2005 when one of the characters in the story, uh, Jerry Moran, bought this house. Uh, he was a retired Air Force pilot uh, and he had been with friends buying and restoring old houses. Uh, and he found this house, which was in not great shape. All the outside cladding had to be replaced. Uh, 
uh, and a lot of work had to be done on the inside, uh, but they finally ended up with a really attractive house. This, this house in Charleston is called a Freeman's Cottage. It was because after the Civil War, this house dates from about the 1880s. After the Civil War, freed black slaves built houses for themselves and they were often of this kind, which is a one room wide narrow house, usually one story, maybe with an attic uh, and a veranda on one side. What was unusual about the renovation was the interior because they discovered that the exterior cladding was in really bad shape, had to be replaced. But the interior, when they removed the old sheetrock, they discovered it was really beautiful pine boards that had been covered up for so long and preserved and were in great shape. Uh, and here is a, a view before anyone moved in of the interior. What, what they decided to do was simply clean it up uh, and varnish it rather than cover it over. And also they discovered there were many layers of paint, which in the more than a hundred years had been applied to this wood. And so they, uh, rather than painting it, they left it and it's a kind of record of, of what was there. <clears throat> of course, they had to modernize parts of it and the modern additions like the lighting and the various bath, uh, kitchen fixtures are uh, quite new and not it's not a recreation in any sense. It's an old house that's had new things put into it. Charleston is unusual because when the city was laid out in the colonial period, uh, the blocks were very big. Uh, consequently, the lots are much deeper than in the, than the 100 feet, which is typical in most American cities. They're about 200 feet deep. So when Jerry bought this old house, he was aware that he was also buying a large lot and the regulations in Charleston permitted him to build up to three small houses in the rear. Uh, as long as he dealt with parking, uh, he was able to, he would be able to do that. And that was in his mind when he bought this lot, he was going, the houses would essentially pay for the renovation of the old building. Uh, the first house he built was a, with, with his friend, George Holt, who was, who had a construction company and the book tells their early history. They'd, they'd had by now a lot of, by 2008, they had about uh, 15 or 20 years experience in restoring and building houses in Charleston. And so uh, this was a very small house, uh, about 800 square feet, uh, very similar to a Philadelphia Trinity, basically three, three stories with one room on each floor and a, and a small stair going up. Uh, the difference, of course, is this is not a row house, so it has a lot of windows, a lot of light inside, a very bright house, but virtually no outdoor space. There's no garden. Uh, there's, by the time you've parked cars and dealt with things like that, there are very, there's very little outdoor space left. Uh, here's a view of the in, inside. They recycled some of the wood from the, the old house they had restored. Uh, this is on the ground floor looking at what would be the, the sitting room. And the uh, Jerry and George had an interesting idea of how you renovate and how of, of approaching uh, residential development. Their, their houses were very small, but they put the money into details and materials instead. So the, it's got beautiful paneling, uh, all sorts of nice features, a lot of character, uh, even though it's under 800 square feet. And what they, what they found was that in, in, the, in Charleston with a lot of students, uh, there was a professional school, medical and a legal school in Charleston that, that people liked having small spaces, but, but very beautifully designed small spaces. These are by no means luxury houses and the trade-off is between quality and, and, and size. Here's another view turning around and looking back towards the kitchen area. Uh, 
things like uh, counter refrigerators to, to, to use space, uh, large windows. So a lot of character, a lot of an unusual uh, kitchen, not what you would find in a normal small uh, rental unit. Uh, the second house, there's, there was space for three houses on, on Jerry's lot. And the, the second house was a house built by a young architect who worked with Jerry and George on the other, on the renovations. And he and George had designed the house I just showed you. And this was his own house. Uh, Andrew Gould was a graduate of Penn who had moved to Charleston and worked with George on a number of projects. Uh, he's, he's had a growing family and, and so that they he decided that they needed something more permanent than the rental house they were living in. And he built this small house, which is not much bigger than the house I just showed you, although it's four stories, there's children's bedrooms under that mansard roof. Uh, and there's a workshop on the ground floor. George, I mean, Andrew had a business uh, making accessories for churches, things like uh, pulpits, uh, candlesticks, candelabra, chandeliers. Uh, and so the ground floor of this building, which is actually below the floodplain, you step down into it, is not habitable. It's the workshop and then you have a living room and a kitchen on the first floor and bedrooms above. Again, very much the same uh, approach, uh, not a large house, but a house with a lot of thought put into details. Uh, this, this house, unlike the previous one, but like most houses that they were building, uh, was built in cement block on the outside, uh, partly to resist hurricanes and partly simply to be, to resist rot and uh, Charleston, is what is called the low country. It's a very humid, hot place. Uh, the, he also used really heavy timbers for supporting the ceiling, which you can see in this slide. Uh, this is a slide of the, the dining room, which was an, an addition built later, which I'll, I'll show you, uh, I'll mention later, but I thought I would show it to you in the same much more uh, re sort of representing a later period in Charleston history, more elaborate, more formal, more architecturally developed than the, than the house, which is, represents the sort of how the Dutch houses that were built in very early Charleston history. At this point, Jerry, uh, before progressing, he approached his neighbor. He had had a lot of, Jerry had a lot of experience in this kind of development. And he, re, he knew that if the more you could c combine land and make a bigger lot and things like parking were more easily handled and you could uh, plan it in a, in a more convenient way. And he approached the neighbor who, who was a landlord who owned the house immediately to the north of his, uh, whether he was interested in joining in and, and forming essentially a sort of cooperative arrangement so that they could deal with the city as one owner, a joint owner of this larger piece of land. And the neighbor wasn't really interested in that, but he was willing to sell Jerry the back part of his lot. And that triangle, that rectangle at the top on the right is uh, the piece of land which, all, which almost added sort of 30% to Jerry's lot and, and gave him sort of more options to build. At this point, uh, there was a new, per, new sort of character in the story. Uh, Reed Burgess was a bluegrass mandolin player who had had a successful career, but uh, who was looking for other things, new, new uh, sort of challenges in his life. And he ended up moving to Charleston uh, becoming friends with George uh, and seeing sort of in, under the influence of George and Jerry, he decided to, that he would build his own house. He'd almost dreamed of a Palladian house and the, that little yellow rectangle at the bottom of the slide uh, was a, a lot that was a sort of cut off from the street 
and he approached the owner uh, who was willing to sell it. And so uh, Reed developed a design which was based on uh, Robert Mills's parish house in, Ch in Charleston. Uh, there's Mills designed the circular congregational church, but this was a small parish house next to the church. And that became the model for Reed's house. Reed is not an architect, and, uh, but he had taken some courses with the ICAA and he was uh, very interested in classical architecture and he really admired this house. Mills, of course, is the famous architect who's responsible among other things for the Washington Monument. Uh, here's the house that uh, Reed finally built. Uh, You'll notice it's not in the, in the bottom right-hand corner. What happened was that after he started thinking about developing sketches for his house, when he approached the city about getting a building permit, the city said that it, the lot was too small uh, and that he, they wouldn't allow him to build a house on a lot, uh, particularly since it wasn't uh, connected to the street in any way. Uh, and he, that disappointed Reed, but, uh, Jerry said, why don't I sell you a piece of the land I just bought uh, and it be roughly, it'll be a bit smaller, but you can build your house there. The difference is that it would be a, a house in a row of houses. There was three little houses in that area, in that, that piece of land. And so uh, that model that Jerry had looked at earlier wouldn't work, but he uh, he saw an exhibit in New York City of Palladio's houses. There were models and uh, drawings, some, some of Palladio's drawings. And he was very much taken by the Villa Saraceno, which is probably the, one of the smallest Palladian villas. Uh, it's still, of course, much too big for the Charleston site. And he did something unusual and I think quite ingenious. And he decided just to take the center loggia that three arched loggia and which was about the size of the lot that he was building on and, and make that his house to turn the loggia in effect into a house. And here's the final result. Uh, you, it's about 12 feet deep. So really is about the size of the loggia. It, it, the difference is it has a second floor. The windows are looking backwards rather than here. And, it has these uh, keystone arches and the pediments. The interior is basically one large room. It's sort of like a studio apartment. And uh, those open doors, there's a kitchenette that behind those doors. And on the other side of the fireplace, near side where we're standing is, is a small bathroom under the stairs. Uh, so very compact, but surprisingly Palladian, very tall, about an 18 foot ceiling. Uh, the same sort of beam construction that Palladio used in many of his villas uh, and, and this very beautifully scaled fireplace on the side. Uh, here's a picture of the construction. Uh, I think what makes the house convincing apart from the proportions and the height is also the thickness of the walls. Uh, if you build a Palladian villa out of two by fours, uh, it has a kind of flimsiness that's very unpalladian. Uh, here, the, the walls are eight inch blocks. Some of the walls are 16 inch block, two, two blocks deep. Uh, they're all heavily reinforced and you're basically building a kind of bunker. Uh, but it has this solidity that feels very palladian. And of course, the, then it has arches built out of bricks Then you can see the masons putting it all together. Uh, Andrew Gould and George and Reed designed this house together and Andrew developed some beautiful details. They found a lot of old bricks when they just excavated the foundation and, and Andrew developed these nice details for the pediment and the keystones over the arches using these old bricks. Uh, the second house was built at the same time. This was a house built for Jerry's sister, Mary, who had recently, who had been living out of the country and had recently returned. Uh, it's a very small house. Uh, they had to develop a parking space underneath to deal, to, to fit a car in. And so 
you have a stair going up to the main floor. There's a two story high room behind those windows. Um, that kind of bay sticking out uh, was, it contains mostly the kitchen uh, and it, it's, it's, it's blank, but in fact, it, it looks like uh, permanently closed shutters. Uh, this was this house was designed by George and Andrew. I think it's a very beautiful house with, it, with this step gable at the end and and the woodwork. The interior the interior is particularly nice. A very small house, but a, a very airy house with this two story high living room and uh, a bedroom in the back and a second bedroom. The the story of of Mary and this house is more complicated than I can go into here, but I, I describe all this in the book. These are old half columns that George found somewhere and they, they're they wooden columns which have been cleaned up and uh, are, I think make a very beautiful it's a window wall. At this point, uh, Jerry was approached by the owners of the house to the south of his. Uh, they were an elderly couple. The house was in very bad shape. They were living upstairs, the downstairs, which originally had been a, a restaurant or nightclub, sort of community nightclub, uh, was, was empty, hadn't been used for years. And they wanted to move to sell the house and move to North Charleston where their son lived. Uh, and so this added a significant amount. It was the only additional piece of land that Jerry could buy. So he bought it. Uh, again, it was a house with enough space to, to add to at least two houses behind it. The, ho the house was not in great shape. So for the moment, they just stabilized the walls inside uh, and just to keep it from falling down, basically. Uh, you could see that the sometime in the 50s, some so, the sort of uh, faux masonry had been built, applied to the lower floor. The upper floor was, uh, I think, aluminum, old aluminum siding. In 2011, the, the, shortly after Jerry bought this house, uh, Andrew's parents decided to move to Charleston and they approached Jerry and said, we'll buy the back part of your lot from you and we can build a house and eventually we can build a second house and rent it out and help to pay for, for our, our new construction. And of course they approached uh, Andrew who designed the house for them. It's an unusual house because it's more like a cottage than the standard Charleston house. And it's, it's built with timber framing on the lower floor and the porch uh, combined with more conventional wood construction. Uh, so the timber framing is used to span the large areas of the veranda on two floors and the, and the downstairs, the open living dining kitchen area. Uh, and then more conventional wood construction is combined with that and on the bedrooms. Uh, the interior is, is kind of a arts and crafts with, with lots of interesting wood details and a rather nice uh, staircase that winds up the center. And again, the use of heavy timber for the floor joists uh, exposed to, to view. Here's a view looking in the other direction towards the fireplace and built-in bookshelves. So, a lot of Andrew's houses have really interesting wood details that often he's responsible for himself. And you can see the heavy timber frame on the left with the peg, peg joints. Uh, when uh, Andrew's parents moved in, uh, it soon became apparent that that old house was was actually the main view they had of it uh, was really an eyesore and and Andrew's parents had at one point approached Jerry and said couldn't you do something about fix re renovating this building because we, we really have to look at it it's pretty awful uh, 
Uh, and Jerry thought it would be a good idea for and for Reed, who had moved to Charleston at this point. It was it was not he was renting out the Palladian the little Palladian house, and he was living in rented rooms. But he was interested in becoming a developer, and Jerry thought there's that he would learn a lot by renovating an old house. It's it's much different than building a new house, as all architects know. Uh, you discover all sorts of things that you didn't know about. Uh, and so uh, he gave, he, he sold the, the old house to Reed, gave him the first mortgage on it, and Andrew's parents gave Reed the second mortgage, uh, which allowed him to do the renovation, which in fact turned out to be quite complicated. Uh, once they started really looking at the house and, and taking walls apart and opening things up, it turned out that the foundations were really in, in terrible shape. It really needed new foundations and the ground floor uh, was in such bad shape. And here's the house raised up uh, while the new foundation goes in. And here's the final end result, which re resembles what in Charleston is called a single house, which is a a narrow house, one room wide to get lots of cross ventilation uh, with verandas on one side uh, on two floors. Uh, single houses are usually come right up to the street and what looks like a front door actually is the door to the veranda and the door to the house is further in from the veranda. It's a very unusual type of house that only exists in Charleston, not in any other North Carolina cities. There's a lot of debate about where this came from because it's, uh, although people have copied it at this point, it's, it's not a house that seems that you find in other American cities or, or in other colonial cities. It, maybe it, it was influenced by uh, people from Barbados. There were a lot of um, immigrants from Barbados in colonial Charleston. So maybe that's where it came from. Uh, what is striking when you visit Charleston is that single houses have been built from the colonial period all the way up to last year. Uh, there are very new single houses. There are very big single houses that are more like mansions. And there are small single houses that are really one step up from a shack. Uh, they sometimes have shops on the ground floor. Uh, it's a very versatile type and, uh, and is characteristic of Charleston because it's long and narrow at right angles to the street. Here's a view of the porch is less important today once we have air conditioning, but you can imagine absolutely crucial uh, before air conditioning. Uh, Charleston has brutal summers and, and this makes it a little bit easier. <coughs> Uh, by this point, uh, Andrew's parents had realized that they really didn't want to build a, a house, that it was too, much, too big a project. For, they also, they had developed a, a nice garden in that space behind their house and they didn't want to destroy that. Um, and at the, at the same time, Andrew was in need of an office. He and George had been sharing a space in another building, but that, had, that was no longer available. And... Andrew designed an outbuilding which was would be, serve as his office upstairs, but which could eventually either be a guest space or a rental, small rental unit. It was It had plumbing and electricity and so on, uh, so that it was like an outbuilding for his parents' house. And, and here's a, a, a view of that with the office upstairs and uh, sort of a garden storage and shed downstairs. So you had over this period of time, uh, about a, almost a 10 year period, uh, you have this back area, which was previously empty, um, filled up with houses, about six houses, and then to two older houses renovated and, and lived in, uh, some of them are cut into apartments. Uh, here's, and here's a view, the blue area on the right uh, was that lot which 
Reed had wanted to build on and wasn't couldn't get permission. Finally, Gould, the Gould fam, uh, father and mother bought this land and it was really used as a sort of garden for their grandchildren uh, next door. Uh, but the the blue site in the middle is a a, a site for a, a, an additional house, and there's also on the top right hand corner an, a, th a second house. So here we have we have ten houses. Uh, we actually have twenty people living here. Uh, so some of the houses, the blue chip, which was the old bar, uh, has three apartments in it. So there's a couple and two single people living in it. The Freedman's College was sold to a couple. Uh, Reeds Villa has three, three small apartments in it. So 20 people on one third of an acre. So that's 60 persons per acre, which is a high density uh, for uh, a, a city, a low rise city like Charleston. Uh, here's a view showing Ashley Avenue and the Crosstown Expressway, which was a busy street uh, that runs up on the north part of the site. Uh, at this point, Reed, wh who had been renting a house, uh, his girlfriend moved down from New York and he'd, they decided that they would build a house for themselves. Uh, Reed had a grand piano, she wanted a garden. So it was obvious that the Palladian, little Palladian house wasn't suitable for them. Uh, the problem was that the size of house they wanted uh, was just, the, the land was just too expensive in downtown Charleston. Uh, and Reed, Reed's solution was to, he thought, what if I buy a bigger lot <clears throat> and build my house, but also build small houses around it. And then the, the houses that I sell, the lots that I sell will pay for my house. And then I can afford to, to build the kind of house I want. Uh, and as it happens, there was an empty lot immediately to the east of the houses that I've been talking about. Uh, it, was, it was used by a landscape company for storing peat moss and topsoil and things like that. Uh, but the owner was <clears throat> interested in selling. Uh, and after a long story, as, as you can imagine, Reed was able to, to acquire this land. It was, it was expensive, but he figured that if he was building uh, nine or 10 houses on it, he could work out, the economics would work out. And also, interestingly, it would be a way of connecting the street at the bottom of the slide, which is Bogart Street, uh, with Kennedy Court and the expressway at the top, and also with the lane that led through the houses that I've just talked about. So, so it would give you access in, in two or three directions, which would be a big plus. Here's the house that he and George designed uh, it's it's a court courtyard house with a raised courtyard. The, the house is almost mostly almost entirely oriented to that courtyard. Uh, there's a loggia overlooking the courtyard, uh, and then some exposure to the east and west uh, from that piano room and the, the dining room. Uh, it's mo the house is on one floor. The lower floor has a garage space as well as a rental, two rental apartments. And the upper floor is part of the upper floor that's livable is used as a guest room. So, so this, this house is placed on the lot here. And then there are nine houses, uh, future houses that were planned around it. Uh, most of the urban design was the result of George Holt's work. Uh, it's, Cat Fiddle Street runs from Bogart Street all the way through under a building and into Kennedy Court. And it also intersects with the lane that serves uh, the houses that, uh, Reed, that uh, Reed's house and uh, Andrew's house and the house I talked about. Uh, very narrow street, uh, a kind of urbanism that tries to, to, to capture in planning the kind of qualities of neighborhoods that have grown over longer periods of time. Uh, Reed 
formed a planned unit development uh, and the houses on the left took part in it. So in the end, he had 20 people, including several of the neighbors who joined in, uh, which meant that they were part of a planned unit development, which simplifies things like financing. The, the lady who owned the house on the bottom left uh, was able to refinance a very old house and, and restore it and fix it up and, and even have space in her backyard where she could add two more houses. Here's a model of, of that, of the development uh, showing how, how tight it is. These are uh, all three story buildings, uh, very, very compact. You can just see the three arches of the loggia of Reed's house, which looks at this raised courtyard uh, tucked in completely behind the other houses. Uh, partly it was a question of planning, partly he didn't want his bigger house to sort of stick out and, and he liked the idea of, of wrapping it in, other, in the other houses. The house on the lower, lower left, which is in a slightly different color, is the existing house, which uh, Andrew uh, restored for the owner. She had inherited this house from her, from her mother, uh, who had lived in a long time. This, this house was actually featured on this old house. The, they had a program on Charleston and it showed how this house was re renovated and restored. It was in terrible shape, it was falling down. Reed didn't want all the houses to be just designed by George and Andrew or just by a couple of architects. He wanted to have the, a variety. And so his idea was to sell the lots to different buyers, obviously, but to have different architects working on the lots. And, and rather than give them sort of a rules uh, or an architectural code, uh, he showed them the sort of thing he was hoping that they would build. And one of the things he showed them was this photograph, which is actually the setting of Porgy and Bess from the Broadway show, which was in the, I think in the 1930s. Uh, Gershwin had come to, as we know, Porgy and Bess is set in Charleston and per, George Gershwin had come to Charleston uh, and in fact had visit a lot of black churches, listen to music, and that all influenced the music of Porgy and Bess. I'm not sure what architects, how they interpreted this drawing, which is not what most architects think their work is gonna look like, but you can judge for yourself. Here's the, the street, I would say three quarter finished. There's still a couple of houses that have not been built, a couple of lots that remain outstanding. But there's the, there, this red house, there's a house behind it, the greenhouse and the house with the double arches. Uh, that's not a carport, but that's actually the street running through to the back. Uh, and the, the, the wooden house on the left is an extension that Andrew added to his house, uh, which is a, uh, which gave him that dining room that I showed you. and, and his family had grown and he needed extra space for kids. Below it is parking. Uh, the parking is, is a big constraint since the city does require two car spots for each house, uh, which means it's a combination of carports, outdoor, uh, a, a one, one or two garages. Uh, the, the cars are sort of fitted in where they can be. Uh, the street was all paved in brick. so. It's the car is is dealt with, but it's it's sort of placed in the background, in in some ways very literally in the background. Uh, I wanted to just step back a little bit here and and talk about the implications of this little particular sort of personal project. And in 1987, Christopher Alexander wrote a book, a little book called A New Theory of Urban Design, and it's a it's mostly a description of a studio that he gave uh, at Berkeley with a group of students and using that as a kind of illustration of, of his idea of how cities could grow. But what's, what struck me was his 
description or definition of what he called organic urban growth. And his, his point was that cities grow organically. The cities that are most successful are not often planned in a, in a way. Even Charleston started with a plan. It had a central square, which long since has disappeared. Uh, the neat grid that the, the first surveyor laid out changed and, and there are all sorts of dog legs and angle streets in the city and uh, canals that then became streets. Uh, and, and cities do grow in this organic way. And Alexander described four characteristics of what he called organic urban growth. And the first one was that it, it's piecemeal. There isn't a grand plan, it, it's, it's broken into small steps. And that's certainly the way the projects that I've shown you grew. Uh, Jerry didn't have a big plan when he started. Uh, neither did Reed. Uh, it it all it came together piece by piece, and each piece, in a way, reduced the options for the future, but also inspired options for the future. Uh, Alexander's second characteristic is that organic growth is unpredictable. You, you don't know exactly the way it's going to go. You don't know, you don't know that Andrew's parents have de decided to move to Charleston and, and retire there. And you, you don't know that, that Reed is going to want to live in Charleston, but he wants to, a larger house and he wants a, a garden that, where a real garden, not, not just a balcony. So. Uh, unpredictability is, I think, a, a feature of urban growth, and it's uh, it's always the the Achilles' heel of any grand plan because because cities last a long time, and over that time things happen which are impossible to predict. The internet happens, or uh, cars happen. In the case of uh, the beginning of the twentieth century. The third point that Alexander made is that piecemeal and unpredictable sound like a, a campsite. I mean, a, a trailer park is piecemeal and unpredictable. Alexander's point was that there had to be coherence. It had to hang together. Otherwise it would be just a place of, of sort of like a random growth in all directions. And, and, and there is a coherence to what has happened on Catfiddle Street and next door. Uh, and it's not a stylistic coherence, as you've seen, there's a, there's a Palladian house, there's a kind of generic house that's hard to categorize. There's a house that looks like 17th century Charleston. Um, there's all sorts of things. So coherence doesn't necessarily mean a narrow stylistic uh, palette. Uh, but it means something that you understand. You, you know where the front door is. You, and all of these houses are in a kind of sense, in the most conventional sense, traditional. They have roofs and they have doors and they have windows. And, and when you look at them, you understand them. Uh, when you look closer, then you discover, you know, all sorts of interesting little things. Uh, but there's a, there's a coherence that pulls it all together. The fourth characteristic that Alexander describes is, is, very character, is very typical of Alexander because it's very difficult to understand. He, he inevitably has definitions or ideas that are uh, kind of almost mystical. And so he, he says that the fourth important characteristic of ur organic urban growth is that it's full of feeling. And I, I, I'm not sure what that means, but I thought the best way to show it might be to take you through a piece of Catfiddle Street, and I think you, which has a lot of feeling, and I think it's what one of the, the things that Alexander was getting at. It, it has to do with humanism. It has to do with not feeling like you're in a machine. I think it has to do with uh, feeling craftsmanship, the hand of the person who made it. Uh, th that's all part of it. So here's to get to read 
Reed's house, you have to go down this public, little public alleyway. Uh, that piece of cast iron is something that Reed found years ago and thought he might use somehow. And uh, George and Andrew worked it into the design of, of the, this red house that, that they, they built. So you go down, you can see that it, it, there's something at the end that opens up. Uh, on the left is an, is an entrance way to a rental apartment on the ground floor of this building. And on the right uh, are uh, basically trash bins and utility. It's a kind of utility room. Uh, when you come out there, you find that you're, in a, you're outdoors again and there's a, a, a winding stair going up. And at the top, you have the entrance to that red house, which isn't on the street, but it's on the, it's off this sort of little mini plaza. And the pink house on the left has an entrance which you can just barely see on the left of the slide. You can see the, the house number there. Uh, these are the old bricks that uh, Reed uh, bought from, I think they're 19th century bricks from the Midwest. And that's what he used throughout the the street, they're, they're very heavy paving bricks. And then if you see further up that kind of pagoda like thing is, or not pagoda, but it, it always reminds me of a Chinese en entryway is the actual entrance to the courtyard of, of Reed's house. And you have little details like this fountain, which, which you, you can imagine makes this dribbling sound in that little confined space and a, a window above, which is actually a window from Reed's bedroom. And then, and then finally you arrive and there's this kind of magical, almost Eden-like garden with, with a pergola on the right-hand side and, and, a, and a loggia that leads into Reed's home. Uh, the loggia serves even in pandemic times, and here's a person uh, fighting the pandemic but enjoying the loggia at the same time. Uh, again, the feeling has to do with you notice the the paving, the old clay paving on the on the ground, the, the, or the roof tiles which came from uh, the Caribbean somewhere. Uh, it, a lot of it, I think, has to do with, with the craftsmanship and materials and the, the feeling of authenticity that they have. This is the photograph is also a reminder that this book, and I've just been ma talking mainly about buildings, but my book and this story is, is ultimately, first of all, a story of people because all these buildings are made by people and there are people who have been attracted to Charleston, who, who, who love old Charleston, who are adding to Charleston, but sometimes in sort of unusual ways, and they're bringing their own experiences uh, to that. Some of these people are trained architects, some are not architects at all, some are airline pilots and developers and self-taught architects, Reed was a, originally a musician. So it's, it's an a interesting mix of people. And I suppose the unusualness of what they did is partly the result of, this, of these people and their, the experiences they bring and the sort of the, the little houses and the big dreams that they have. I started out uh, talking about the the subtitle to the book. And I, I wanted to finish by talking about the title, uh, Charleston Fancy. Uh, and the epigram to the book is, is a definition of fancy. And fancy has three meanings according to the Oxford Dictionary. The first is fancy means a feeling of liking or attraction. And that, that is something that you, you get, you feel with the people both in my story, but generally who build in Charleston, they're attracted to the place. There is something about the climate and this light uh, and the way of life uh, that has brought them there. With one notable exception, everybody in my story 
is a, is a person who's come to Charleston at some point, some, in some cases very early in their lives, uh, and has stayed there. Uh, fancy also means the faculty of imagination, and that clearly is a, a big part of this story. And you can see, there are more examples that I, I'm, I haven't shown you, but uh, imagination, of course, is what drives architecture, and uh, particularly in the architecture in a city like Charleston, uh, we think of Charleston as a colonial city, which means it's largely Palladian and Georgian. But in fact, you find Victorian Gothic, you find uh, even uh, Moorish architecture when at one point cropping up. Uh, there, there, except in a very broad sense, there is no Charleston style. Uh, people have built all sorts of things in Charleston. And so you can see some of that reflected in the buildings I showed you. And the, the third is my favorite because it's, it's an old term from 16th and 17th century music, a composition for keyboard or strings in free or variation form. And I think that's one of the key elements of the architecture that I've shown you is that it's, it's free. It's a, there are variations on old ideas, there are porches and columns and windows and doors, uh, but they're, they're variations and they're, they're carried out with a great deal of freedom. And the result I think uh, is a very human and a place that is both special, <clears throat> which it would have to be in a city like Charleston uh, and modern and old uh, all at the same time. Thank you very much. That's my talk, and I'd be happy to take uh, or deal with any questions that you might have. Hi, everyone. Please um, post your questions if you have them in the chat function. And thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. <laughs> you must have covered it all. I think, let me ask, ask myself a question then. One of the questions I've had after a talk like this is whether I, whether I think this is a model for other cities. And I think that's always a question. There are, there are so many American cities trying different ways to either restore themselves or renew themselves. Uh, and one of the problems in a way of American urbanism is that cities are always copying each other. They're, uh, you know, sh pedestrian malls become a fad and then suddenly they crop up everywhere. And then we discover they're not such a great idea. And then, and then these places are stuck with them or, or urban shopping malls uh, or, or, and good ideas, urban parks spread across the continent very quickly after Olmsted Central Park. Uh, so cities are always on the lookout for a great idea. And so when somebody says, what is the lesson of what I've shown you? I'm not, in this case, I don't know if there really is a lesson specifically. Very, Charleston is a very small city. It's a high density, low rise city. There are no, or I should say there are very few high rise buildings in downtown Charleston, unlike most American cities, uh, it's, it, except perhaps Washington. Uh, so it's unusual, it has an unusual history, it's very old. <clears throat> it grew up when Georgian architecture was all the fashion in England. And so that was a big influence on the early buildings of Charleston. It gives it a, a certain consistency that most later cities lack. Uh, but one, one striking thing about Charleston is that, uh, and I talk a lot about the history of Charleston in the book, is after the Civil War, uh, Charleston really sank into virtual oblivion. Uh, it had been probably the, one of the richest cities in the, in the colonies. Uh, it had this very busy port. It was where you shipped out cotton, uh, indigo, rice, uh, all these things. It was on the great trade route, but 
partly as a result of the civil war, which destroyed, of course, unfortunately, the, the plantation slave industry, uh, and partly as a result of shipping, which changed to steamships, so they, they no longer followed the great circular route of, of sailing ships. Uh, and Charleston really, it shrank, uh, it became a very small city, very unimportant city. And what is most impressive about Charleston is that the rebirth of Charleston, the, 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 the Charleston was the first American city to have uh, zoning that recognized historic buildings. Uh, the Supreme Court had declared zoning legal but Charleston was the first city to use zoning codes to preserve old buildings. Uh, what's striking is that that was not done when Charleston was a booming tourist uh, destination as it is today. It was done when Charleston was an extremely poor, ignored uh, sort of backwater city. But, but the people loved their old buildings. Uh, they saw that they were losing these buildings uh, partly what was happening was that antique dealers from New York and Boston and Philadelphia were coming to Char Charleston and just buying up old buildings, taking out all the beautiful old uh, paneling or uh, fireplaces or what, what they could find and then demolishing the building and taking these and taking them back to New York or Boston or Philadelphia. And so uh, the Charlestonians uh, despite not having great resources, decided that they would save their, their old architecture. And, and a lot of the old buildings that we see today uh, are only there because of they are either rebuilt or, uh, or prevent it, prevented from being destroyed. They, they, they set up a very elaborate system which prevented people from demolishing buildings. You can't just get a building permit. There is a it's one of the very few cities which has an architectural review board, which is not a advisory board, but which has veto power over whatever happens in on the peninsula, uh, which of of the old of the city, which is re virtually the entire peninsula at this point. The, the the historic zone was increased over time. So I think the the lesson to cities of Charleston is that you don't need money and you don't need to be a very successful place. In fact, by the time you're successful, it's probably too late uh, because the pressures are too big. Perhaps one of the reasons that Charleston succeeded in saving so much was that the, there wasn't a pressure from developers to build things. The city wasn't growing. In fact, it was shrinking. People were leaving the, the downtown. And so uh, they were able to save their architecture. And of course, today, Charleston is, is very successful. There's employment. Uh, there's not just tourism, but in Boeing has an assembly plant there. Uh, and now it, the, the challenge, of course, is to preserve Charleston in a, in a time when it's more, much more difficult to do that. There are large projects taking place in Charleston. Some are good, some are not so good. Uh, and, and that's all, I think, changing the city. But the fact that they were able to sort of pull themselves up by their own bootstraps at a, in a kind of period which you wouldn't think a city had a lot of options is what impressed me the most about Charleston and, and historic preservation and, and saving old architecture. There's a lot of questions about zoning and how modern zoning ordinance, ordinances would allow for something like this. They just, they have, uh, I, I talk about one example in the book, which was the um, Clemson has an architecture program in Charleston. It's like a satellite program where students come and spend a semester in Charleston. Uh, and they, uh, they had engaged a modernist architect to, to build a new school building. Uh, and basically it was just turned down. Uh, and it, and they b it became such a hot issue that Clemson, which of course didn't want to upset everybody and they, they were trying to fit in. And so they, they simply withdrew and they ended up installing their program in a 
restored tobacco factory. Uh, it's actually a much better solution. But so one of one of the one of the things that Charleston has is because they have an architectural review board which has real teeth. They're they're able to control development in a way that most cities aren't. Most most cities like Philadelphia, for example, it has an urban design review board, but it's purely advisory, and it really it can't just say no. Uh, it can't say this building is too high or this building is too large or or anything like that. So I think that's that is an advantage. It doesn't mean it's not a hundred percent, and there there's still some pretty second-rate large modern buildings being built in Charleston now. Uh, and I think in some ways, the challenge for Charleston is, is that it's successful. It was easier when it wasn't successful. When, when my story starts, uh, George and uh, Jerry and their friends in the late 80s uh, are, are building in places which are basically deserted, where most of, most of the houses on the block are empty. They've been abandoned. Uh, and, and so they're sort of like they're urban homesteaders in a way. And, but that's a very different situation than today where land is very expensive, where Charleston is seen by young people as an attractive place to live and work. Uh, and the city, is, it's much more complicated to build. Uh, I, I talk about the various challenges that Reed had in developing his project uh, and, and satisfying the city, which is now much more demanding than it was uh, even 20 years ago. Could these houses have been contemporary and achieved the same end? Partly, I think uh, there are, there are, there are, for instance, examples of what you would call contemporary single houses. Uh, to my eye, they, they lose a lot because being contemporary, they don't have much detail. And being contemporary, they tend to have, uh, they don't use decoration at all. So a lot of the charm of the old houses, which comes from small amounts of decoration or a certain amount of handicraft around the entrance or the doorway. If that is taken away, the house, uh, even though it's similar in, in form and volume, uh, loses a lot. Uh, there's a, such a fad today for painting buildings strange colors like all black. An all black house, an all black single house is really not a terribly charming thing to see. It's, it's sort of depressing. So I, I would say that there's up to a point, there's a kind of general feeling of a building fitting in, but when you get close and look and you, you miss the details or uh, if, if you're a modernist and you want to be, to have a kind of industrial aesthetic uh, that changes the house a lot. Uh, when instead of having, you know, old brick, you have something that looks like a factory. Uh, I think Reed in his in his houses, he he didn't design all the houses, but he certainly uh, interacted with all the different architects who were building on Catfiddle Street, and he had a, he had a lot of demands which had to do with like why does everything have to line up so perfectly or trying to make it look a little bit less mechanical or uh, trying to, to give a little bit of character to various parts of the buildings. Those are not qualities that are uppermost in a modernist aesthetic. So uh, having him remind the architects of that, who were in fact all traditionalists. So it was in his case, he wasn't interested in in buildings that were radically modern, and but there certainly are some in, in Charleston. It's 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 a mixture. Well, thank you so much, Vitol, for your presentation tonight. Um, and I'd like to say thank you to everyone who joined us, and also um, give a shout out to our presenting sponsor from tonight, Pine Mar, 
just say thank you again for their support and for all of our sponsors who support us. So have a wonderful night and we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Goodbye, everyone.